Welcome to the Business of Race podcast, where we examine how race and racism impacts business and what corporations and organizations can do to address these issues, as well as create a better work environment for everyone. I am your host, Regina Newkirk Rucci, the Director of Equity for 90 Forward. And today in the conference room, we are joined by the always magnetic and magnanimous Tom Karen, who is the Vice President of Donor Services for the Community Foundation for Northeast Florida. And he is also working on his MBA, MBA candidate, so bringing lots of business knowledge to the discussion. And we are also joined by the illuminating <laughs> and luminous Dr. Kimberly Allen, who is the director. CEO, not director, CEO of 904, uh, racial justice and equity nonprofit here in Jacksonville. So welcome to the conference room. Thanks for Thank having us. Thank you. All right. So we're going to just get right down to business. And today's agenda item is looking at corporate social responsibility uh, two years after the murder of George Floyd. So when George Floyd's life was so viciously taken in front of us, uh, and I think that's also very key, right? We were in the middle of the pandemic, everyone was home, um, and everyone really witnessed in real time um, his murder. There was such a social outcry, right? Uh, the country was very upset. And so corporations really sort of put a lot of pledges out um, that they were going to do all of these things to address this issue. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what this issue is. But wound up with about $50 billion pledged um, with corporations. Um, when we talk about this, so, so my first question really would be, are corporations really poised to address racial issues like this well? Um, does that make sense from a corporate standpoint? Should they be the ones who are trying to take on racial equity, racial justice? Um, and if not, why? And if so, how should it be done? That's a good softball question. Well, well, easy. <laughs> um, so as you mentioned, earning my MBA, so there's a, a framework called triple bottom line accounting, which is how does, you should be measuring more than just your profit but also how is, what's your impact on the planet and the people around you. And that then spurred the ESG movement and CSR, corporate social responsibility, corporate citizenship. So there's an increasing acknowledgement that it isn't just about profit. It does include how are you treating your employees, your vendors, your other stakeholders, not just your shareholders. So I do think at a baseline, there is a role that every company has to play when it comes to racial justice and environmental justice, et cetera. But for racial justice, there is a role. The flip side of that is they, we have to right size our expectations about what those companies can be responsible for. Um, I do think one of the best things that have come out of the paradigm shift post George Floyd's murder was that we're no longer talking just about interpersonal racism. We're talking about structural racism. Companies have played into that, right? So they have to explore their own history. We need to understand uh, how governance structures and policies have withheld opportunities from Black Americans. At the same time, government has played a lot in that. So I think what's interesting is seeing that companies have taken more of these public stances from a policy standpoint, which gives me a little bit more hope that that will spur additional change, not at the responsibility of the companies, right? Because they got their own work to do, which we'll talk about. But it will allow the conversation to continue with lawmakers. And if if I were to look at the two spaces right now, politics and and corporate America, there's one that's making a lot of noise and doing and it's causing a lot more harm than good right now. 
then, and you know, we've got an election two weeks away. Companies can't take their foot off the pedal of holding policymakers accountable. So that's kind of my opening salvo of, I, I think there's absolutely a role. Uh, I think we have to right size our expectations on what their in uh, their locus of control can be, though. Well, and I think that's a really interesting point, right? Because I know when I worked in the banking industry, we were writing some very sizable checks uh, back mm. when there were really limits on how much you could give candidates. Uh, we were writing sizable checks to candidates yeah. and making sure that the door was always open yeah. um, when we had a concern. And so there really is a strong relationship. I mean, most corporations are also political donors for that reason. Yeah. But I don't know that they have been large activists in addressing some of these racial and structural racism issues um, in the way that they could be. Yeah, and I would say that they haven't been. Um, and to to your point, Tom, companies absolutely have a responsibility. Um, they have they have political capital, they have mm-hmm. financial capital, yeah. which is a lot of you know where the pledges went. Um, but they also have people capital. Um, and that's why it's yeah. important that those CSR efforts and ESG efforts, are pointed inward too, because even if they can't um, sort of tackle the the big picture of systemic racism outside of their organization, um, they have the ability to address it within their organizations. Um, and they have uh, control over the policies and things that are in place, um, and they don't necessarily exercise that, that power sometimes. Um, in addition to having um, these PACs, and they have political figures, who they can pick up the phone and make a, you know, and, and make a request. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is, you know, yeah. what what are the things that are going to benefit my business? Um, but a lot of the things that are going to impact your business, um, impact your employees, in particular in this social climate, I think the political capital is one that I have not seen as readily used um, in this moment as I think it could be, could have been used. And, and yeah. there is the ability for a both and, right? Mm-hmm. It's not yeah. that... I have to ask you for something that's going to financially benefit my business or something that's going to address structural racism. They do have the ability to ask for both. And I think that's also a different mindset. We tend to be focused on one thing as opposed to, hey, we can address a couple of things while we're in this meeting. All right. Well, so as we look at what happened with George Floyd, because one of my concerns is that the giving and the response was reactionary. And generally speaking, when you have reactionary responses, they're not really well thought out and they're not going to be as impactful, especially when you're dealing with something as historic and as institutionalized as racism. So when we look at, uh, the response after George Floyd's murder, what would you say some of the corporate downfalls were in how they responded uh, with their giving or their dollars allocated to address issues of race and racism? You want me to go start? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's think about strategy. If I was sitting in the seat, you felt the urge, the urgency both from a human standpoint, right? Let's assume some of this came from an altruistic perspective of any person in leadership at a company. I feel like we ha- something has to be done. There was also the urgency from the employees and from your customers w- demanding something. So the f- easiest thing to do is put words together, string a, a, a length of words together to make a statement. I think one of the strategic errors that could have been is if you talked, you now have to walk the walk. Mm-hmm. And in some statements that came out, you already had accusations of uh, performative justice, right? Performative statements. The framework that comes to mind is um, philanthropy as relief. And that is, you know, there's an immediate need. I'm going to throw some money at it, but it, it does not have a long-term impact. The The tradition of philanthropy as relief is we're going to solve for the hunger on the street today or the rebuilding of a home due to a storm. Giving a social reform is very different and it requires a much longer term lens and framework and decision making. And so I think one of the strategic areas 
and opportunities is whatever that statement was, if that becomes your mission vision statement for this work, how are you building a robust strategy internally and externally around that statement? Um, I think many companies are going to continue to face, remember that? Remember that statement you issued? And that could become a an albatross around their neck that was well-intentioned in the moment and time, but they have to know that those words aren't enough and that strategy and investment in the long term, right, short, middle, and long term, is going to be required to bring those words to life. And people are watching, right? So people are paying attention um, in any given space. Customers are aware of what the companies are, and they're seeking out that information. So I, I think the strategic error is assuming that those words were enough or that these large pledge amounts were enough because this conversation... I hope, for all of our sake, will not slip from the headlines in a year or two, right? right. Well, and we talk about these large pledge amounts, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Fifty billion sounds like a tremendous amount of money, but then when you look at it, right. you know, more than ninety percent of that was loaning um, or making investments where the organizations would still profit from it, and. Uh, even the majority of that was really with two banks. So when you allocate money or you make these statements and then I'm going to dedicate all of this money and it sounds like really giving, but then when you start reading between the lines, oh, but you're still making money, you know, how does that, how does that read? How does that come across to the community as far as your commitment to really addressing the issues of systemic racism? Well, I think the hope is that folks don't read the fine print, right? Um, right. That they see the big headline and the big number and say, yeah, folks are going to get, yeah, congratulations, give you a round of applause for for addressing those things. But to those of us who are in this work um, seriously and long term, and we're looking at things like that, and we're saying that's that's not a, a an actual solution here um, and and calling to the carpet the fact that to your point points need to just um, you need to put some measures something tangible behind um, those statements Um, but also like don't be afraid to look in the mirror right because there there is a lot that can be done externally I'd be happy if you gave zero dollars but you really focused inwardly in your organization and drastically transformed some things to make uh, equity a priority for the people who work for you every day or who you service every day. Um, it doesn't always have to come in terms of external dollars. Maybe you could have used those dollars to raise salaries, uh, mm-hmm. the floor of, of your, you know, what you pay uh, for your your minimum wage. Um, any of that could have been considered, yeah. but when you, it's sort of a rush to the be the first to uh, give the big amount or be the first to make this grandiose statement, yeah. um, I think you miss out on opportunities that are really, I mean, could have been beneficial and really done a lot to garner support within your organization so that when you're ready to do some outward things, you have a compass and you have some results on what you've done internally to share with, with the community. And then there's buy-in that you're genuine in what you've been, been yeah. giving. Well, and that was a yeah. lot of feedback that particularly the tech companies were getting yo, you made these grandiose statements, but we still don't see opportunities for people of color in positions in these fields, especially in leadership and higher level, decision level um, making positions. And so it felt empty, right? And I think uh, some corporations have bumped into that. So switching gears just a little bit. We're two years out. We're going to give some advice uh, to corporations. If you want to put some meat behind the words, if you really do want to address systemic racism, if you really want to take CSR very seriously in this area, what are some things that you would suggest that corporations look at or examine as possibilities to make a longer term or a more sustainable impact? Yeah, so I said people, planet, profit, and the other P is philanthropy. So I'm going to hit on people and philanthropy. I I had Michael Jackson in my head as you were saying. I will spare you all from singing the lyrics, but you got to take a look at the man in the mirror. And so if the most important place to start is 
what are your people metrics? Where are you hiring and attracting people of color, diverse backgrounds and thoughts? How are you promoting them? How are you retaining them, right? If that is the work that is done over the next five years, I think we will have a significant shift in power across this country, not just at the company level, but in our own communities. You, that is the systemic change that I think companies can be held uniquely responsible for, is how are you promoting the talent, recruiting, building, and investing in. Now, from philanthropy, I know it, was a, it wasn't a new space, right? It may have been a new space to some funders, but it was definitely not a new space. So I want to acknowledge that full stop. For you as a philanthropist, so if I'm setting up a corporate strategy, it may be new to me. And so there may have been those reactionary, here's a big dollar amount, but now I'm at a, shoot, I want to make sure I'm doing responsible grant making, or I want to make sure I'm investing in the right organizations. But they had no working knowledge of that space. And so I'm not entirely shocked that there's been a delay in, in some of the reports that you'll see is they haven't released those dollars. That doesn't mean that those dollars that you committed can't like still do good and need to get out into the community. So how are you making those investments? Presumably over the last two years, you have, any business leader, has come across the list of um, Black-led, Black-serving organizations in their community. They've identified the organizations who are doing uh, social justice work on a variety of spectrums. And I think about supporting candidates. How are you supporting advocacy organizations who can also work with the policymakers? And in some way, that actually shields the organization from any threat. So, you know, cozying up too closely to any given politician has its concerns. But if you're investing in a grassroots or an advocacy organization, it it's interpreted and feels different. And so that may actually behoove organizations to invest what would have been political dollars into ag advocacy organizations in their communities who then, when you get the tax write off, because it's a 501c3 in most cases, all organizations can do advocacy to some extent. Um, and again, they're not bound by the political, the short term political sound bites that politicians are. Um, and we're seeing more and more that's becoming. Um, a concern of companies, right? We've cozied up too close and this person just went off the rails and said something and uh, whether it be a politician or a celebrity. Um, there's a canon, there's someone in mind that I'm thinking of, or several. Um, so I think there is a role for philanthropy, but I would lead first and foremost with their people work. How are they investing in the recruitment, the retention and the promotion of people of color in their organization? Yeah, And I would similarly say, um, the economic well-being in particular of um, employees is important. Um, or, and I would say, the economic well-being of communities of color. And so that also means who are your vendors, yep. right? Who are you ordering supplies with? Who's on your vendor list? Is that diverse? Um, yep. Because you could be supporting small minority-led businesses um, and that is a way to, you know, put dollars out into the community. Um, disaggregate your data. Mm -hmm. Figure out what you're, what you're paying your employees. Is it equitable? Is it equal in some cases where it needs to be? Um, are there opportunities for educational advancement? Um, and then not putting all the onus, I would say, on your employees of color to mm -hmm. do all of this work to get promoted. A lot of times employees... Um, have the credentials, they have the experience, um, but they are passed over for promotions and opportunities to be directors and leaders. Um, and so what does it look like yeah. to also train decision makers on how they can identify talent and promote them from within um, and not overlook someone who is truly talented because um, they don't do or think right. or exist in the same way that, that you do. So I think there's work to be done, not just um, to to further the, the advancement of, uh, or you know, pour into professional development for people of color. I think it needs to be with white decision makers as well um, on the corporate side and really um, who's on that vendor's list. It makes me think of uh, Heather McGee as the sum of us, mm -hmm. right? So the initial reaction is, we're going to list the people who are being harmed the most are people of color who are overlooked. But 
Very next to that are the white colleagues who are not seeing the blind spots or the opportunities that they're overlooking. Of no fault of their own, but they don't live. They have a different lived experience. And so I think as more companies start to promote and retain, they're going to see that it is, in fact, a competitive advantage for them to have a diverse workforce, to be ensuring that their local community is strong. I love vendor analysis and how much are we relying on, and this is work that we can all do in our you know, own kitchen table economics, how, who, where do we spend our money, right? Am I out of convenience going to something that can deliver to my door tomorrow? Or am I taking an extra step to literally walk a, a block or two to shop at a local business that, you know, may be minority owned or female owned or veteran owned, whatever that might motivate in you. Um, those are incredible micro decisions that can have a big impact at the corporate level. Well, and I also think that corporations get a lot more bang for the buck if there's a through line. If you pick your issue, right, I, there's so many components to systemic racism, you're not going to be able to address them all. But for instance, if you're going to uh, pick the issue of pay equity, yeah. if you're doing that work internally, and then you're also working with organizations that support that, if you're also yeah. making that plea to the political candidates and That's organizations right. that you yeah. support, right? Because that way it's consistent and yeah. or your employees really see that you're doing the work internally and externally. And I think that connects for people because if you, you're doing it here, but you're supporting candidates who don't right. do that, then yep. were you really, and right. I think that's also where corporations get tripped up. If you yeah. are really trying to promote lo more leaders of color, then we are looking for um, vendors who have leadership of color. We are working with organizations that have boards that have, you know, representative and diversity. But again, having a through line, so this is our issue and we're doing it in all aspects of our business, I think you're going to wind up getting more bang for your buck. But I agree with you. I think that oftentimes we operate from the we're going to be taking away or even just that we're going to be doing it differently. And you find out that the more diverse your staff is, the more diverse your organization is, it really does impact your bottom line positively. Yeah. And that's been proven time and time again. So it really is financially beneficial for corporations to do this work as well. And uh, something you said, the good news is companies have been refining their CSR strategies to make it more and more aligned to whatever their business industry has been. So it used to be, mm -hmm. I could give philanthropic dollars anywhere that someone was serving on the board. Um, having been a frontline fundraiser for a decade, you then saw like a shift in companies giving a little bit everywhere to finding those areas where they wanted to go deep. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, the muscle has been built. So if they were to pick a single racial um, justice topic or area and go deep, they have that experience already. So that's one. Two, a lot of this goes down to people work. And I know not everyone, depending on your community or the political headwinds, feel comfortable using the term social justice or racial justice. A lot of this work can be done without putting that label on it. Mm -hmm. And so I would hope that companies, we're investing in our community. We're investing in, our, like, that is a soundbite that no one can push back on. Um, but the, right, the devil's in the details now. So people aren't going to look, right? You're going to have those people who are really wondering, like, who is the community that you're speaking of? But most are just going to say, oh, I've made a commitment to um, invest in my local community. We're prioritizing small business owners. Again, that's a, a PR win for the company. If they then do the extra work of ensuring that those vendors are also people of color and that we're making sure that the floor for any of our employees, uh, period, is of a livable wage, it, it's only going to continue to do good for them mm -hmm. um, from a PR standpoint, but also for the retention of all employees, not just the people of color. Um, and we know how tight the labor market is right now. So yeah, pay equity is an interesting, I feel like it's a very tangible and there's a lot of work that short and long-term wins that companies can secure if they were to focus on that. Well, you talked about something we, that I think is really important for us to spend a minute discussing and that is the 
political wins in 2022 are very different than they were in 2020. And so now corporations may feel a little bit more angst about saying that they're going to do racial justice work or social justice work. We don't want to upset anyone. Um, And I think a lot of employers want to do the right thing, but don't want an uprising in their offices, on their boards, et cetera. So what would be some strategies that you would give corporations in addition to the one that you just said um, about being able to sort of navigate what has become a little bit of a political hot field uh, so that you can still do the work, you can still back up the statement you made two years ago, but you don't throw the organization into a tumultuous state? I mean, Tom, you hit it right on the head. I think first start with Heather McGee's book um, to understand, right, that... We are not making royalties. (laughs) It's an incredible book. Everyone should read it. It is the the best because um, in raising, like, because pay equity is what we're talking about right now, Mm -hmm. and raising the floor, right, we're not just saying, oh, only black employees are going to be, you know, on this floor, right? That helps everybody who's making below whatever... The livable wage is. Um, and I think in talking about it, not because I, I, I also fear of sort of watering down the message, right, because we, we don't want to do that. But um, in saying that we are increasing pay to, you know, no one in this company makes less than $50,000 because we value the people who are on the front lines for us every day working hard. You deserve to go home and not have to worry about a second job. How are you going to put food on your table? Uh, Are your lights going to be on? And we care about you in that way. And that's not singling out a particular group. It's saying I value everybody here who makes below this, and I want to make sure that you are taken care of. We don't do that anymore as a part of this company. We are going to show our respect for you and how much we value you by doing this action. Um, And I think... Showing people that is this is a value proposition. I, I, mm-hmm. I and I value you as a person. I think goes a long way, and you don't have to use any of the sort of buzzwords that make people cringe and tense when they hear it. But I also think a lot of corporations. You know, um, when I started my career, I started in banking, and I think banking is probably one of the most corporate of areas that you can have. <laughs> We're about making money. I don't have time for all this squishy, touchy-feely, make the world a great place. It's a business. We're here to make money. What is the business case for engaging in corporate social responsibility and engaging in racial justice or social justice work? Who's going to buy your products? (laughs) Who's going to work at at your front desk if you aren't showing that you value what they bring? Um, If you can't demonstrate that you value the communities that you're in or the employees who worked who work frontline and a lot of companies banking included tend to be people of color. And if you can't show that you're going to have a hard time filling some of those positions and you're going to have a hard time bringing in the dollars from those communities as well. And so you don't have to be squishy. You can do it in a way that feels, you know, corporate to you, but you got to do it. Yeah, the. I, I do think, and this was even before George Floyd, the perception that profit is not intrinsically connected to people and the communities in which you serve. I, I don't. If you are listening and you still hold that, I would ask you to do some more homework and reflect on, just as you're saying, if you don't have customers who can afford your product, if you don't have people who are willing to work with you and stay working with you, um, I mean, from a financial business case, if you were to measure the... Um, turnover rate and how much money you're spending on training alone. What are the things that you can be doing in-house to increase retention? So it's one thing to be turning over. And again, generally those entry-level positions are filled by people of color. If you were to pick certain industries, they're losing out on a lot of talent and retention and their costs are going up and up and up because they have to constantly train. So if you paid them a livable wage and treated them with respect and dignity and, and gave them a, a, a sense that they belonged in that company, they would likely see a dramatic reduction in costs, which would help their bottom line. So 
I don't, um, I'm not one to think that profit is not intrinsically uh, impacted on the people metrics, full stop. Great. Well, we're going to bring this discussion to a close, but before we go, what would you say is, from this very robust conversation we've had, what would you say is your number one takeaway for anyone who's listening for a corporation, for an HR manager, for a business leader, uh, for a CSR officer? What would you say is your big takeaway from um, this conversation today? Well, thank you, because uh, this was fun. And I think for me, and I I think I thought I was going to have a conversation, and this went in a different direction, but I think in a really valuable one. If I was to give one piece of advice, it's find that one focus area that you can go deep in that does look at racial disparities within your company, but it also has the impact of systemically improving working conditions for all of your employees and or customers. So I, I think pay equity just resonated at the top as a great example of one, but there's no shortage of other opportunities. Does your product serve every available person for whom it could serve? You know, the infamous example of um, hand dryers or soap dispensers at airports, but the sensors were not designed for picking up black skin tones, right? So does your product inhibit your ability to reach other customers because you didn't, you didn't, you have that blind spot. So pick that one area and go deep and, then make it an iterative process. As you learn from those experiences, where can you then take it to another part of the business? Yeah, I think the the piece of advice that I would give to businesses is to disaggregate the data um, and allow that to guide where you go hmm. deep and wide. And I agree, Tom. I don't think you should spread the peanut butter too thin, right? You don't want a you know chunky or down. creamy. <laughs> <laughs> Now Definitely I'm hungry. Creamy. Oh, good, um, good, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you don't want to spread it too yep. thin, right? Um, and, and and miss the impact. But I'd also say commit to long term. Yes. Um, I think whether you're doing the work internally for your staff and employees, um, or you're doing it out in the community, this is not a five year problem. Um, this is a crisis in. Um, it's going to take significant dollars and time and investment to get out of where we are. Um, but companies have the opportunity to be examples, I think, for what one other companies can do, but also how our government can take action, how, you know, um, other, you know, nonprofits, and how all of us can take some action um, if we're willing to, to stay the course long term and not sort of go in and out because it's a because it's, it's philanthrop uh, philanthropic dollars tend to want to sort of see the result and disappear. Like, let's stay committed to this long term. Yeah. yeah, I think for me, it would be for corporations to really go back, for those who made statements, to look at what they said. And for those who didn't, to perhaps come up with a statement. But then to take the time to really be strategic and not reactionary in how they're going to address it. So it is in a way that makes sense for them as an organization. And it is something that really does align with the values of the organization as well. And that's something that employees will say, oh, okay, they really did mean it. Because I think, especially right now when we've got such, uh, so many people who have openings, recruitment is a, is a, is a challenge, retention is a challenge. People are really looking for those value alignments. This is a great opportunity to really look at that reorganization and do the hard work, but the smart work that's going to make everything better. Well, it has been such a pleasure having you both in the conference room today. Thank you for bringing so much wisdom to this very important topic. I hope that it has been beneficial for our listeners. It's certainly been enlightening for me. So thank you so much. And that is it for today's episode of The Business of Race. We hope to see you in the conference room again real soon.